Well, let's bring it up for Hutch, because that's this series, two-part series. Hutch is taking us through head games. Right. Thanks, Chris. If you have a Bible with you this morning, grab it and be turning over to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It is probably a book in your New Testament that is not well worn. Unfortunately, uh, 2 Corinthians may very well be the most neglected book of the New Testament. And it's a shame because it is a, a very personal look at Paul's life. And it is a, a point in time in Paul's life when he is having to defend his his uh, apostolic call and position, and uh, there is false teachers that have moved into the city of Corinth. It was a, a major city, a major thoroughfare, a lot of traffic and commerce is taking place in the city. Paul plants this church, nurtures it for just a little bit under two years. He goes on and continues in his missionary journeys, gets word of some shenanigans that are going on there, and he writes... Uh, literally a third letter to the church at Corinth. Two of the four are not included in our scriptures, and the only way we know about them is Paul talks about the letters that he wrote that aren't included here. And then finally he comes back after he is encouraged that some of the false teachers who are trying to undermine his apostolic authority, trying to come in and, and, and take the spiritual leadership role in this newly planted church, have kind of settled down a little bit. But he's, he's spiritually wise, and he understands that they've really just kind of moved below the surface. And so he writes this fourth letter, our, our book of the Second Corinthians, and he gives us some great instructions in this text. And when we get to chapter 10... Uh, there is a change in the way that the Apostle Paul addresses the people of this church. And he gets pretty strong, pretty firm, pretty fervent in the remaining chapters from chapters 10 to the end of the book. And so as this change takes place, he gives us some very clear instruction, some very important instruction that you and I need to be able to understand and to heed and we really want to focus our attention really on just one phrase found in verse number five this morning. But before we get there real quick, I want to ask you a question. This looks like a pretty sharp group today for the most part. Uh, some, you know, not so good, but close. How many of you this morning, as you got up and got ready to come to one thing, had to Google, you had to write yourself a note to remind yourself that there was a thing called Google that would help you to find out how to do stuff, had to Google, how do I brush my teeth? Let me see your hands. Not a single person here had to do that this morning? We didn't brush your teeth. That's one way to get out of that, all right? <laughs> Those of you who have hair this morning, how many of you had to Google, how do I comb my hair? <laughs> how many of you had to... Uh, use your phone to figure out how to get to Cabernet Steakhouse this morning. Very good. That's, that's legit. But the truth of the matter is, is we do things like brush our teeth, shave, comb our hair, put on our clothes, and do all of those things, drive to one thing without really thinking much about it, don't we? I mean, we, we pretty much have got that down pat. And the, the brain is an amazing thing. I mean, if you think about it, the, the human brain weighs approximately three pounds. It consists, it's made up of about 75% water. Within the human brain, it contains approximately 100,000 miles of blood vessels. It is an amazing thing that God has created. It uses about 20% of the oxygen that the human body intakes. At any given point in time in your day, your brain contains about 20% of the blood that is circulating through your body. It's an amazing thing. When it comes to dreams, everybody dreams. You may not remember it, but you dream every night. Those who study such things tell us that every person has between four and seven dreams every night as they sleep. The human brain 
it is said, can have over a period of 24 hours approximately 70,000 different thoughts. The human brain is such an amazing creation that it can process information up to speeds, and I don't know how you figure this, but they do this, up to speeds of 268 miles per hour. Your brain is absolutely amazing. I remember growing up, there used to be an advertisement that said, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And it really, really is. It is such an amazing creation of God. And you know who realizes that? Not only our creator God realizes that, but the enemy of our soul, Satan, the devil, he understands that too. And he comes against us as followers of Jesus Christ on the battlefield of our mind. The spiritual battle that is raging all around us doesn't take place around the conference table. It doesn't take place around the desk. It takes place on the battlefield of our minds. How many of us in this place have ever done something we knew we ought not to do but first, we didn't think about doing it. How many of us have not done something we know that we should have done without first thinking, I'm not going to do that? The brain is an amazing creation. Look at what the Apostle Paul has to say about this. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're just going to look at verses 3 and 4 and 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Back in the fall, one morning after I had taught, I sat here at Aaron's table. And as we were going through the questions, we had a, a, a situation where I, I told Aaron, I said, Aaron, if I get to teach in the spring, I think I want to do a, a series called Head Games. Because of what I was going through and the attack of the enemy in my life and because of what I wrestle with and struggle with. And it's because every single one of us wrestle and struggle with the same things, don't we? We really do. We may not want to admit it to ourselves. We may not want to admit it to those around the table. We may, may not want to admit it to our spouse, but we fight a battle every single day. And one of the ways that Paul instructs us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to be able to win this battle is to take every thought captive. How do you do that? How can I take every thought, the 70,000 thoughts in my day, and take them captive? Well, what does it mean to, to take something captive? It means to take. It means to seize. It means to, to, uh, to take by force. And so what that implies is, is that you and I have to work at it. It doesn't come natural. And we need to have a means whereby we go about taking every thought captive. And so I want to give you more than you can use this morning. I'm just going to say that up front. And I want to encourage you to take out a pencil or a pen, lipstick, mascara, something, and write this stuff down. Because you and I are going to need it. It is absolutely essential to being able to win this battle that you and I are winning. And I know you want to win. I know you don't want to lose this battle. I know you want to win this battle. I want to win this battle, and I wrestle in this battle, and I struggle in this battle. But I want us to be able to at least be equipped to fight this battle, especially in the area when it comes to taking every thought captive. So we're going to use the word captivate 
as an acrostic. And that's what I mean. I'm going to give you too much stuff for you to take in today. That's why I want you to write it down. That's why I want you to be thinking about it over the course of the next seven days because we're going to come back next week and we're going to focus and zero in on just one verse and that is Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. And we're going to do a talk and a study on this phrase, think on these things. That's next week. But before we get there, we got to have some tools in our toolbox if we're going to be able to win this battle for the mind. If we're going to be able to take every thought captive, there's a lot of room at the bottom of your notes to write this stuff down. All right? Here you go. The letter C stands for cognitive awareness. Cognitive awareness. Now, that's not a phrase and a terminology that we use very often, but simply put, what I wanted to get across there is this. Be aware of the mental faculties and the struggle and the battle that's going on. Look at what the psalmist wrote in Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed or truly happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight, his joy, his, 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 his everything is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. There's an action-orientedness to this. So I must be, first of all, cognitively, mentally aware. The letter A stands for apply truth. Apply truth. Jesus in John chapter 8 said these words. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Do you know truth from error? The other day I was... uh, was at a gentleman's house, and of course, we work with adults with disabilities, and one of the things we do is we run a thrift store, and one of the services we provide is to go and to pick up large items that that a person can't bring to us, and so I had Adam, one of our employees with a disability with me, and we went to Ernest's house, and we were picking up this piece of furniture, and as we were picking up this piece of furniture, I'm literally rolling it through the door, and I see a couple of gentlemen who make it their spiritual discipline in life to go and visit every door and knock on it and share what they believe to be good news, although it's not good news because they believe that the way that you get to heaven is by doing what they're doing and earning your way there by your works. And they love to talk about Jesus, but they don't recognize Jesus as a as a savior, as the very son of God. They, they think of him more in terms as the first of God's creation. And as good as all of that may sound, it's, it's false. So how do I know what is false? By knowing what is true. How can I determine what is a lie? By knowing the word and knowing what is true. Listen, gentlemen. Listen this morning. If the only intake of truth you receive is on a Friday morning or a Sunday morning for a half an hour or 20 minutes or whatever it is. You do not have enough to sufficiently fight this battle. The enemy loves to keep it that way. You set a goal that I'm going to get up early and spend time alone with God and his word so that I can know truth. And then all of a sudden you'll find it really, really hard to get up in the morning. Or you'll find that your alarm clock will malfunction. Or you'll find a good reason to stay up late and watch a national championship football game so that you can't get up early the next morning because you rationalize with yourself, I gotta get my sleep, I gotta get ready, I gotta get to work. And so all of a sudden, all these forces work against that. But you gotta know and apply truth if you're gonna take every thought captive so that you recognize the lie and know what to do with it immediately. The letter P, predetermine your plan of action. Predetermine your plan of action. 1 Peter 1 verse 13, the very last passage of scripture on your growing deeper page. It says, therefore, look at, listen to what he says. He says, preparing your minds for action. Preparing your mind for actions, be sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you're going to take every thought captive, you need to predetermine, what am I going to do when a stray thought crosses my mind? You know what happens to me? Maybe this doesn't happen to you. 
Maybe I haven't got there yet. But I can be reading my Bible in the quiet and the stillness of the early morning hour, and my mind wonders to think about the phone call that I got to make. The situation I have to address. Or just something stupid, you know? So I got to work on disciplining my mind. If I don't have a predetermined plan of action to get me back on course with truth, I'm just going to continue to wander down that trail, aren't I? Does anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about? So I've got to have a predetermined plan of action. Cognitive awareness, apply truth, predetermine your plan of action. T, test every thought. Test every thought. Psalm 139, David writes these words, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The more you test your thoughts, the less you have to do it further down the road. But get into the habit of testing your thoughts. Is this good? Is it pleasing? Is it positive? Is it encouraging? Is it destructive? Is it going to lead me down a path that I'm going to be sorry I walked down? Test every thought. I, this is a word we don't use very often, but I needed an I, so we're going to use it anyway, all right? And you can ask Siri how to spell it later on. Just simply write it down. Imperatively, guard your eyes. Imperatively. What does that mean? It means with every ounce, with certainty, with definiteness, imperatively, guard your eyes. Look at what... Um, Psalm 101 and verse 3 says, and I love the way the ESV says it, because I grew up understanding this verse, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. That makes clear sense, isn't it? That's not hard to understand. But notice the way the ESV translates it. I, I love this too. It says, I will not set before my eyes anything that is what? Worthless. How much of our day is taken up with the worthless. Have you ever stopped to consider that? I would venture to say, if you were to take and journal your thoughts over the course of the day, you would find that much of the thoughts of your day, far more than you realize, are focused on the worthless. There's no worth, no value in it. Okay? Cognitive awareness, apply truth, predetermine your plan of action, test every thought, imperatively guard your eyes. V, value that which matters most. Value that which matters most. Jesus was asked a question. The religious leaders tried to trick him. So of all the, the laws that we've been given, what's the most important? And what did Jesus say in, Matthew, or in Mark chapter 12 and verse 30? He said, he said, you shall love the Lord your God. How are you going to love him? <clears throat> with 100% of your heart, with 100% of your soul, and with 100% of your mind, and with 100% of your strength. You say, Hutch, doesn't say 100%. Well, what does all mean? Does all mean 99? 80? 100% of my mind. Don't give the enemy a foothold in your mind. Listen, if you come to my house and knock on the door, and I come to the door and I pull the shades beside the door and I look at it and I see that it's Maurice. And I don't like Maurice. I don't want to let Maurice in because I know Maurice is going to cause trouble. I keep the door locked. But guess what happens? I'm probably a little bit bigger than Marie, so if necessary, I could probably take him if I have to, right? But I opened the door and I said, Marie, get off of my front porch. I don't want to see you. And I start to shut the door, but guess what he does? He does a simple thing of slipping his foot in at the bottom of the door. The door remains open. I cannot shut it. I can push it. I can shove it. I can put my shoulder into it. I can use every... Every ounce of this brazen, glorious, muscle-bound body to try to get him out. 
That you laugh at. All right. Why? Because he has a foothold in my door. And the enemy would love more than anything to just simply be content to hold his foot right there. Because truth be known is, is his foot inside my door is going to outlast my muscles. Because he's not expending any energy. He's just letting his shoe do all the work. Am I right? I'm right, ain't I? Don't let the devil slip his foot into the door of your mind. The only way to do that is by taking every thought captive. So you got to value what matters most. When I'm clicking through a website and I have an option to choose to look at pornography, if I value my marriage, my children, my family, my reputation, my name, I don't go there. Why? Because I value those things that matter most. When I have an opportunity to go into an establishment that is less than positive, encouraging, and faith building, I remember what I value most, and I say no because of this. The letter A. The letter A stands for access your escape hatch. Access your escape hatch. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 basically says this. You will not be tempted beyond what you are able to stand up under, but will with, what does it say? With the temptation make a way of what? Guys. It's printed there in, on your notes. But will with the temptation make a way of what? Let me help you here. The word is escape, okay? Let's try this again. I know that you're committed to finding that way of escape, so you're going to be committed to saying it with me. But will with the temptation also make a way of what? Escape. Let's try that again. But will with the temptation also make a way of what? Escape. But will with the temptation also make a way of what? Escape. How often? Every single time. There is an escape hatch. The devil blinds us to remembering there is an escape hatch. He blinds us to looking for that escape hatch. He so enthralls our mind and so encourages us to continue down this path of drifting away from the things of God that we refuse to look for the escape hatch. There is always an escape hatch. But you got to look for it. And then you got to take it when you find it. Access your escape hatch. The letter T, talk to God about everything. Talk to God about everything. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything. How many things? Everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your what? Minds in Christ Jesus. Do you realize you can talk to your heavenly father about everything? Everything. He knows what you're thinking, but he wants a relationship with you that's open and honest and real and continuing and ongoing. And he wants to talk to you about everything. And then finally, the letter E. Always have an eternal perspective. Eternal perspective. Cognitive awareness, apply truth, predetermine your plan of action, test every thought, imperatively guard your eyes, value that which matters most, access your escape hatch, talk to God about everything, and then finally, always have an eternal perspective. Colossians 3 and verse 2. Set your mind on things that are above, things that are eternal, not on things that are temporal or the things of this earth. You are not a physical being that happens to have a soul. 
you are a spiritual being that happens to have a body for a period of time. You do realize that, right? That's significantly different. I was made by God for eternity. This is just a small little blip of time in which I am wrapped up in this human flesh. Therefore, because I realize that there's a lot more of eternity ahead than there is in this present moment, I always want to keep it in mind. Because when I do, it will help me to take every thought captive. Now, I told you I was going to give you too much, and by looking at you, I can tell that I did. We're going to go to the tables. We've got some questions around the tables we're going to ask, but then I'm going to come back and I'm going to give you one more thing, okay? I'm going to sum up everything we've said this morning in three words, and I guarantee you, you'll be able to remember those three words when you walk out of here today. God bless you as you go to the tables. As a, uh, as a communicator, you, you try to study the room to see whether or not people are sleeping, whether they're with you, whether they're overwhelmed. And it was interesting just to participate at my table, but also hear the level of the room. It didn't start off really loud. I was a little concerned, but it got really, really loud towards the end. So obviously there was some, some buttons that got pushed along the way. You know, the last thing we said was have an eternal perspective, and uh, Aaron wanted me to make sure that you guys know about that day as a, uh, a story of great rewards is coming up on January 22nd uh, just around, at a church just around the corner for, from here. He has some tickets today that are available at $10 a piece. Make sure that you see Aaron, this handsome man, devilish man here with hardly any hair on the top of his head, if any, uh, if you want to participate in that and help that ministry go forward uh, Seasons of Life Ministry is a great, great ministry, and you can help. Uh, it'll do you good, too, and help you keep it in eternal perspective. What did you guys talk about around your tables? What, what stood out this morning? Somebody help me. Where, where, where was the focus? Chris. It's easy to develop a bad habit, isn't it? Yeah. Very good. Somebody else? Uh, Steve? You talked about Eve. What? You talked about Eve in the first part. Eve? How the, the anatomy of her sin, mm. how you know, she went by the tree multiple days, uh -huh. and never had any luck to die to us in the flesh, but until Satan started tempting her, and she accepted a block, uh -huh. then she can walk with God. Great point. We always run down a wrong path when we allow ourselves to entertain the temptation. Um, it's been said that you cannot stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from building a nest there. And uh, somebody great said that. I can't remember who it was. Who was it? Martin Luther. Yeah. And, and it's so very, very true, isn't it? Steve, what did you guys talk about? One thing that resonated with us was the escape hatch. Escape hatch.
Yeah, that's good. It's it's good to um, to know where that exit door is when you're in a movie theater and you don't know when the tragedy may come. It's good to have a plan for your family. If a fire takes place, we're going to get out and we're going to meet here to make sure that, that everybody made it out okay. You've got to have a plan. And I know this morning the, the acrostic captivate was, was a lot. And uh, last night over dinner, I kind of went through it real quick with my wife. And she goes, oh, man, you're going to do that over two weeks? I said, no, I got, I got so much, I've got to give it to them all at one time. She goes, that's too much. And I know it's too much. But I want to be able to boil it down to just three simple words today. Everything that we've said up to this point, if you can get these three words, if you can remember these three words and start this process of taking every thought captive, it'll go a long, long way towards your success. Don't set captivate aside. Keep it in front of you. Allow those principles begin to to bear fruit and to be birthed inside of you so that you will have a cognitive awareness. You will have an eternal perspective. You will have a, 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 a predetermined plan of action when certain things begin to, to creep up in your life. Worst case scenarios, if you were, okay? But let me give you these three words, and, and I guarantee you, you'll be able to remember these words, all right? I absolutely guarantee you, you'll be able to walk out of here today, and if you start with these three words... In this idea of taking every thought captive, it'll begin to catapult you forward. It'll, oh, and by the way, let me say this. I'm not the expert on this, okay? Don't look to me and say, Hutch never has a wayward thought, never does. I am so far away from that. I am a fellow sojourner on the struggle of captivating, it, taking every thought captive. So I don't come here and say, I, I, but I, I'm just learning some things, and maybe I'm a step or two farther down the trail, okay? I'm not way at the end. Looking back, saying, Dave, come on, man, you can do it, take everything. I'm not there. I am still learning it. But these are three words that when a thought comes into my mind that shouldn't be there, when I, when I, when I apply the truth and I know this is something that I, that I don't need, it's going to lead to problems down the road. What happens is this. I want you to whatever you do, do not think, whatever you do, do not think of a pink elephant in tights, okay? Do not think of it. Resist that thought. Stop thinking about a pink elephant in tights. There's no tights. There's no pink elephant. Stop thinking about it. Stop working at trying to block out a pink elephant in tights in your mind. Some of you are looking at me like, what in the world has gone wrong with this guy? Here's the principle. Three words. Don't resist, replace. Don't resist, replace. The more I consciously try to stop thinking about the pink elephant in tights, the more my mind thinks about a picture of a pink elephant in tights. So if I, instead of trying to resist those negative, bad, valueless, useless thoughts, I replace them with truth. I replace them with scripture. I replace them with prayer. I replace them. So the three words, would you say them with me this morning? Guys, here we go. Don't resist Replace. Boy, you guys did a good job on that. That is amazing. You should give yourself a round of applause for that. That was awesome. Don't resist. Go ahead and give yourself a round of applause, all right? How many of you think you can remember that? Don't resist, replace. Let me see your hands. You got it? All right. If you don't have it, write it on the palm of your hand. Look at it. Don't wash your hand. Some of you don't wash your hand anyway, so they're going to be there for like next Friday. But the, the easiest first step, is to recognize the importance of those words. Don't resist, replace. And God will help you not only to take every thought captive, but to bring every thought and every fiber of your life, as that passage says, into obedience as we follow Christ. God bless you. Be back here next week, Philippians 4 and verse 8.